Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For those who come to God must believe that he is and that he's the rewarder of those who seek him. I'm telling you, if you seek God, you will not go away empty. If you seek anything of the things of God, you will not go away empty. And any time God has something for you, if at all possible, and you can get to it, you should. You should avail yourself, especially now as we see the end times come to their head. You look out and you see squirrels gathering nuts. And why are they gathering nuts? Because they know some very harsh things are coming. And they want to be ready. Okay. Look, nature speaks to us. Wisdom cries out in the streets. Okay. We should be gathering now while we can, whatever we can. To avail yourself to prayer. Avail yourself to Bible study. Avail yourself to witnessing to people. Work while it's light. Night comes when no one can work. Because there is something very harsh coming to this earth. There is tremendous changes, and there is a religious test coming for everyone that lives on the face of the earth. It will go right through the heart of everyone in this room, and everything that we really are will be revealed. So um, let us prepare ourselves. Now let me read a passage of Scripture, and then I'd like to comment on it um, this morning. 1 John chapter uh, 1, verse 5 through 10. This then is the message which we heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And then he goes on to say that uh, if we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we're lying. We lie and are not doing the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. See, the worship team was led by the Spirit this morning to sing 1 John uh, 1, 7. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Notice he keeps going back and forth between what, we, what we're telling ourselves and what the reality is. And by the way, it's very important to get reality, okay? We need reality. We don't just need to tell ourselves whatever we think we are. It doesn't matter what you think you are. It doesn't matter what I think I am or I think what you are. All that matters is what's really there, truth, reality. And that's what this whole passage is about. And he, he talks about how, how we, t we tend to tell ourselves this or that or the other. If we say we walk in, dark, uh, in the light, uh, if we say we know him and yet walk in darkness, we're lying. Who are we lying to? Ourselves. People lie to themselves. It's the human condition. If we say that we don't have sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. I'm not going to say I don't have sin. I got too much light. It shows me I do have sin. Someone says, Pastor Bill, when are you done repenting? When the last bit of indwelling sin is gone, that's when I'll be done repenting. It's a repentance is a way of life, just like faith and love are. You're never done until you go to heaven. And he says in verse 9, if we confess our sins, how many are familiar with this verse? You should have a well-beaten path to it in your Bible. This is simple, but it's very profound. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm telling you, this is one of the best verses in the whole Bible. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But then he goes back to the self-deception. Uh, if we say we haven't sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. The things we tell ourselves versus the reality, right? And that's what this whole passage is about. The subject is light light or darkness. And this passage is a great illustration of what it means to be in the light, to walk in the light, and, or to be in the darkness. By, by the way, there's only one, two options. There's not a middle one. Those are in the light, those are in the darkness. You're either in the light or in the darkness. What does it mean? What is it all about? And notice where he starts. 
He starts with God. Everything good starts with God. And everything good starts with the true knowledge of God. Okay. Who is God? What's God all about? By the way, before I go any further, I'll just, I'll just relate. Why is this letter written? Why is this letter written? Well, what, what does it mean to be a Christian? What are we saying that we have when we say that we're born again and saved and we're Christian? We're saying that God has brought us into the knowledge of God. Through the, the forgiveness of sins, we know God, right? And, that, and so who knows God? That's the, always the question. Who knows God? Well, whoever has been born again, whoever has accepted Jesus Christ, whoever has been forgiven of their sins, whoever has come to Jesus Christ, those are the ones who know God. The re- letter is written because just like today, and all through church history, by the way, but especially today, false prophets, false teachers, false concepts of Christianity came in and confused the people by redefining what it means to know God. What does it mean to know God? See, I remember this happened to me very early in my Christian walk, that I came to the knowledge of God. I was a Roman Catholic. I did not know God. I sat in a pew for years, looked at a crucifix, actually loved the figure on it, but didn't know what it meant. What's it all about? One day, man, he just... The penny dropped. He showed me something. The man on that cross is dying for your sins. Boom! Substitution hit me, and I came to know. You know what I'm talking about. The only true God. That's what John calls him in another place. Listen to this verse. This is life eternal. That they might know you, the only true God. It's another name for salvation, eternal life. What's eternal life? To know the only true God. But what happens if someone comes along and substitutes something that's not the only true God? We've seen what happens, haven't we? When people come along and redefine what it means to know God. See, for me, at the beginning and all the way up till now, what does it mean to know God? Well, God speaks to me through Scripture. And I don't go around feeling God and God didn't tell me what clothes to put on this morning and I don't go from one vision or revelation to another the truth is my life in this world is more like scurrying through a desert from one little green patch to another little green patch to a little watering hole to another watering hole but the whole world is a desert and most of the time I don't feel a thing but like one scripture says Peter said it We've never seen him, but we love him. Amen? Amen. But along came the Gnostics. Anyone ever heard that expression before? G-N-O-S-T-I-C-S. That's a Greek word that means knowledge, the knowing ones. The pseudo-Christians who came along and redefined for many what it means to know God. In my case, the first one was Kenneth Copeland, who was preaching one day on TV. And he stopped in the middle of his sermon and said, wait a minute, what God? What? Oh, really? Oh, okay, yeah, well, I'll do that after the sermon. And I, I looked at that and thought, what? I don't have that kind of walk with God, are you kidding? I don't even know if I know God. Why don't I know if I know God? Well, all I got is scripture. All I got is no feeling All I got is prayers I offer up and wait for answers. All I got is a really rigorous life of discipleship that I've undergone. And we were talking about this the other day. Add to your faith knowledge and virtue and moral excellence. That's all I got. Kenneth Copeland talks to him and he talks back and they have a conversation and he can even say, "Uh, I'll I'll get to that later, Lord. I got a sermon again. And he went back and it just shook me about what, what? And I could go on and on, I won't, because I've spent years battling these, these evil imposters of Christianity, Rick Joyner, Kenneth Copeland, the whole lot of them. But all of them, it's all the same thing. Redefine what it means to know God. Rick Joyner 
regularly goes to heaven, sees visions, writes books of word-for-word -word transcripts of prophecies he's received. Wow. They collect the books. They love them. They revere them. They revere them so much that they're more important than this book. Wait a minute. All I got is this. And that's basically how the Gnostics come across. You still on elementary school here? And for a lot of God's sheep, it shakes them up. It, des it destabilizes. Many, many churches have been ruined. Many, many Christians that started off with me no longer follow God. They just, they've been ruined following these, these evil people, the very people Jesus warned us about. Many will come in my name in the last days. False prophets, false teachers, false revelation, and peddling a false knowledge of God. Remember what Jesus said in his prayer on the night he was betrayed. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God. What if you get the wrong one? What if you get the Mormon God? Some say, well, Mormons are sincere. Billy Graham told Larry King Mormonism didn't bother him. No problem. Um, Joel Osteen says Mormonism is all right. Wait a minute. The Mormon God is not the triune, infinite, personal God of the Bible revealed by the prophets. He's the spirit brother of Satan. Oh, yeah, but they're sincere. Sincerity won't keep you out of hell. Many people in hell are way more sincere than most Christians I've ever met. They're totally sold out to their false religion. They make us look like fools what, the way they dedicate themselves to Jehovah of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, aren't those good people? It's not the only true God. How important is this? How close? The, Jehovah, the Jehovah's Witnesses is not, Jesus is not Jehovah. Jesus is not God. They insist. Jesus is not God. Jesus Christ himself said, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. That is the ultimate disaster. That's the worst thing that could ever happen to anyone is to die in their sins. And it's even worse because a lot of people think they've got light. See, we're talking about light here. You know, Jesus warned in the Sermon on the Mount, if the light that's in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Well, it's one thing to be in the dark and to know it. A lot of people are in the dark and they know it. I don't know what's going on. I have no idea. Other people have a light in them, but it's darkness. It's darkness. My friend Warren Smith wrote a book called The Light That Was Dark. He was in the New Age movement. He laughed at Christians. He said, we're so far beyond that, it's incredible. These people are stupid. We got the light. How are you going to reach someone like that? If the light that's in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? So we go back, so John writes a letter, and I've explained this in so many other places, and I wrote a book about it, but basically he always starts with who God really is. God is light. What do we mean by that expression? Well, just think about it. Light is the most beautiful and useful thing in all of nature. Okay, light is... We need it, right? In the beginning, God said, let there be light, right? It's the emblem of purity and splendor. The Bible says God dwells in light that no man can approach. It's the emblem of knowledge. If you got light, you got knowledge. You can know something. You're not in the dark. You're not stumbling over stuff you don't understand. You can see. If you got light... You're safer than if you don't. You feel safe, right? The little kid says, don't turn off the light, Mom. I feel safe. And I think light has a lot to do with love. The people that love truly, there's a light, a light on. And what does light do? Light reveals things, Right? I'll never forget the first time I went to church. Well, I mean, a non-Catholic church. I went to an Assembly of God church. 
and I didn't know half of what was going on. They were speaking in tongues. I thought it might be Latin or Greek or something. But I'd tell you one thing. I felt like the preacher was talking to me. I felt like he was exposing my sins. And I knew better somehow. I knew. No, no one's telling him about me. He didn't fashion this sermon after me. But man, it sure gave me that impression. And I read many years later a scripture in the Bible in the first Corinthians. It says, how do you know if you're in a real church? And one of the things he says is, when you go to a real church, if God's there, the secrets of your heart will be revealed. All of a sudden you see yourself. Why? Well, the truth is, because you're in the light. God is light, and there's no darkness at all in him. I mean, think of the story of Isaiah, who went to the temple just like he had so many other times before. He was familiar with worship. He was familiar with the temple. He was familiar with its services. He was familiar with its furniture. He was a Jew. He was a, 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 a practicing Jew. But one day he went to the temple, and he actually saw God. In the year King Uzziah, he said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And he saw holy burning angels cry one to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then what happened? He saw himself. He was in the light. He saw himself, and he cried a curse on himself. He actually said, Woe is me. Which, you know, you read the Bible and you think, well, you know, what's that mean? You don't even pay attention. Woe is me means I am going to hell. I am doomed. I am a sinner and I deserve it. Woe is me, he said. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king in his glory. See, when you really see God, you end up seeing yourself. And you don't like what you see. Why? You're in the true light. You're living in a cave. You say, well, I'll pick out my white T-shirt today. Put on your white T-shirt in the cave. But if you ever go out in the sunlight and see someone with a real white T-shirt, and you look at yours, it looks gray and yellow, okay? Because in the true light, everything gets seen for what it really is. Light reveals. I think the story of Isaiah is very similar to the story of the conversion of Peter. Peter didn't know who Jesus was. He thought he was just a pit, uh, 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 another preacher. And Peter's a fisherman, and he's a Jew, but he didn't know that Jesus was the Messiah and, and, and the light of the world and God. He just thought he's another preacher. So the, when Jesus borrowed his boat, well, every, everyone knows preachers are always asking him for something. Uh, he, he, uh, he lent it to him. He lent it to him. And when Jesus was done preaching from the boat, he said, Peter, launch out in the deep for a catch. And this is really something else. You know, Peter remonstrated at first. Oh, God, I just put my nets away. We've been out all night long. We didn't catch a thing. But then he said, wait, because you're, you're saying it. All right. They launch out in the deep. They let down their nets. And they get so many fish in there, they can't even contain them. But the, the point of the story that reminds me of Isaiah is Peter's reaction. It literally says, falling down and looking up. He said, depart from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. See, this has happened to me when I saw the Lord in the Assembly of God Church so many years ago. And when I saw Christ and the people worshiping, and the tears are streaming down their face, down people of all walks of life, I didn't know what it was. Never seen worship like that. But I did know God was on the receiving end. And I hated myself from then on. I thought I, I loved my image before. I'm a good Catholic, born old boy. But I hated myself. I couldn't live with myself because I saw all my sins. You know what that's called? Being in the light. God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. And doesn't the Bible also say Christians are light? 
You are the light of the world, Christian. You know why the world hates Christians? It's a mystery sometimes. Why does the world hate Christians? Why do they want to persecute Christians? Why do they fear Christians who are nonviolent even more than they fear Muslims who are very violent, vicious, and deranged? Because we are the light of the world, and light is very scary to sinners. It exposes. Everything comes out in the light. You are the light. The Bible's the light. In thy light shall we see light, it says in the Psalms. The Bible's full of light. So you open the Bible, you're looking at light. This is not a nor, 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 normal or ordinary book. This is a book full of light. This is why people are uh, mitigated away from the Bible. They don't want the Bible, they don't want it. And even Christians find sometimes that reading the Bible goes against nature. What that is is part of your sanctification. You just go right back in there and look at it, open it up. It's the light that exposes your soul. Got to see it. Christians are the light. Jesus is the light of the world. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And he says in the verse that the worship team was led to sing this morning, if we walk in the light, stop and think with me, what does that mean? To walk in the light. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Well, if you go backwards, you write, know it right away. Walking in the light could not mean being sinless. Because he says one of the consequences of walking in the light is you'll be constantly, what it literally says is, you will be constantly cleansed from each and every sin. It'll just be an ongoing thing. So to walk in the light does not mean to live in perfection or to be completely sin-free. Thank the Lord for that. Amen. As a matter of fact, walking in the light or coming to the light is the only indispensable condition for fellowship with God. The, the, the beautiful truth is sinful man can come to God even while he still has all kinds of sins and problems. If he's willing to come into the light. Hold your finger in First John and look with me in John chapter 3. No, I'm not trying to promote anything, but I did write a book about John chapter 3 recently. I can't remember the name of it. Oh, yeah, Born from Above. <laughs> John chapter 3. What, uh, what a powerful chapter of the Bible. I mean, everything in it is powerful. John chapter 3, though, and these are the words of Jesus in... in uh, and this is what he says after he says, for God, for so did God love the world. What, what it literally says is, for so did God once love the world. Did you know that? The Bible says that God only loved the world once. It's not like he has an ongoing love relationship with the world that goes up and down with the world. Once did God love the world. One time, one place, one incident is where God poured out his love for the world on Calvary. The world can never know the love of God anywhere else or on any other terms. For once, God loved the world when he sent his son. He doesn't have an ongoing relationship with love with the world. I mean, the world is under judgment. The sentence is about ready to be passed. The ax is at the root of the tree. The world's doomed. But one time, in one incident, one thing is where he showed and revealed love for this world that hates him. And that is on the cross of Calvary. Did whoever believes on him, no, whoever goes on believing on him will go on having eternal life. But that's not even... Guess what? That wasn't even the verse I was going to have you turn to. Go to verse 20. 
Oh, we'll start at verse 18. He that believes on him is not condemned. But he that believes not is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You know it's a sin not to believe in Jesus. It's a sin. You have no, nobody has any excuse. You, it is a sin that you'll be held accountable. It's the ultimate sin. To not believe in Jesus is a sin. That's what he said. That's the basis of condemnation. The whole world is under condemnation. Here's the basis of condemnation. They did not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now why wouldn't you? Anyone that ever hears about Jesus, you're hearing about truth. You're hearing about goodness. You're hearing about the only goodness. You mean you're going to reject the only goodness? The only truth? I can show you wild savages who the first time they heard about Jesus instantly knew, whoa, that, that's the creator, that's God. And you're so sophisticated, you're not going to? That's why I'm telling you, this is an evil generation. Very rebellious. They're not mistaken. They're rebellious. Now, let me go on. This is the condemnation that light came into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Now here it comes to a very important subject. What you love. What you love. Jesus Christ is like the touchstone that reveals the thoughts and intents of your heart. They pretended to love God. And they, they had all these rituals. Of it. They were so pious until Jesus came along. And he showed that love. The light of Jesus showed up that love as, as hypocrisy. It's, it's not even real. Everything not real gets shown up in light. Okay. He's the touchstone that reveals the secret to your heart. Uh, whatever you really are, that's what, once you have an encounter with Jesus, look, once you have an encounter with Jesus, you'll never be the same again. Either you'll be worse or better. Many are worse, way worse. Why? Because he really showed them what they were. He revealed it to them, and they couldn't deny it after being with him. He showed them whether the people pretend to love God, but they won't come to Jesus. They don't love God. And he says that when the light came into the world, the problem was they, did, they, they, they loved darkness more. They loved darkness more than light. See, the whole thing is about what you love. Be careful what you love. Everyone has many, many, many loves because that's what it means to be a human being. I love my wife. Well, I, someone says, I love sports. I love football. I love politics. I love education. I love knowledge. Okay. But everyone has a master love. At the core of your being, something you love deeper and supremely above everything else. And you got to be careful because whatever you love the deepest is what you'll follow. You will always follow it. So that's one of the things we recognize about ourselves as we come to Christ. Jesus, I love all the wrong things. If we could just get honest, right? Change my love. Anyone ever prayed that prayer? Change the love of my heart. Take this love, this lust of me. Give me the love for the right things, right? He says... Everyone that doeth evil, 20, hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. And that word reproved just means exposed. Okay. And everyone that doeth truth, he that doeth truth, comes to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they're rotting God. What's this mean? Okay. Notice he says evil is something you do and truth is something you do. Truth is not something you know, it's something you do. What does it mean to do evil and what is the essence of evil? Well, they go into the darkness. They go to the dark. They love the dark or they love their sins. They love the deeds they do. What does it mean to come to the truth? It means to come to the light. 
okay. See, back there when I was talking about Isaiah, his knees are knocking. He's calling curses from heaven down on himself. He's literally damning himself. I heard about a revival in one of the Scottish islands in the 1950s where well, these ladies were concerned about the deadness of their town, the spiritual deadness. No one was going to church. No one was going to prayer meeting. The kids were getting backslidden. They were going to dances, and they're doing all kinds of crazy things. And they prayed and prayed and prayed, and then a few other people joined and prayed. And then the Spirit of God came down on the little village. This is in the 1950s. And the kids were at the dance hall on Saturday night, and almost like a cloud descended on them of conviction Many of them dropped to their knees there, crying inexplainably, saying, I have to get back to God. And they drifted out in the street, and some of them were heard to be saying, hell is too good for me, Lord. Hell is too good for me. (laughs) You wouldn't come to that conclusion other than by the Holy Spirit of God. I mean, most people have no idea the enormity of their sins against God. This is why grace is not all that amazing to people in this evil generation. You couldn't even begin to appreciate grace unless you got some light on what sin really is and on the enormity of the guilt that you really have. Then grace means something to you, right? But when everything's grace... Jesus loves you. I know. That's his job. Like, did you ever hear the French atheist? He's dying, and one of his friends say, hey, what if you're wrong? Aren't you afraid of that? He said, not really. God will forgive me. That's his job. Would you want to be him right now? Uh-huh. He's, he didn't have the light, did he? When the light comes in, you're like those kids. Hell is too good for me. Or like Isaiah, woe is me, I'm damned. Or like Peter, Jesus, get away from me, I'm a sinful man. What happened? Light happened. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And to come to God is to come to the light. And here's the thing. Many people, probably more than not, they flee the light. They get out of there. Get me away from that church. Get me away from that preacher. Get me away from that gospel witness. But then they still kid themselves. They don't say, get me away from them because I'm so sinful I don't like it. No, they're judging me. I want to go to a church that makes me feel good. God is light, and him is no darkness at all. Anybody here? If we walk in the light, what's it mean to walk in the light or walk in the darkness? It doesn't mean you're sinless. It means you're willing to stay and to be known for who you are. Isaiah stayed. Peter stayed. Okay. The kids in Scotland, they stayed. They, they, felt, they said, hell would be too good for me. They cried out to God until they got relief from the burden of their sin by crying and asking God for forgiveness. Many people are in churches that have never had anything anywhere near an experience like that. They won't know anything about it. I I wonder how many are really saved. A person that's saved has seen God. That's what it means. Your eyes are open. How many of our songs are about seeing? I once was lost, and now I'm found. I'm blind, but now I see. What do you see, though? You see the light. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. What do you see in the light? Myself. Do you like it? No, I hate it. So says, that church really builds up my self-esteem. Well, if I were you, I'd get out of there. <laughs> Feet don't fail me now. <laughs> get me out of there. 
I, I talked to a practicing homosexual going to a church in Houston, Joel Osteen's church. We used to evangelize him, speak to him, and pray with him, and he just blew us off. We called him out on his sin, and he hated us for that. But he said, I found a church. Why don't you know, Pastor Bill, I found a good church that makes me and my homosexual partner feel good about ourselves. Oh, are you kidding me? You know, you know what the Bible says the essence of a false prophet is? False prophets give sinners assurance that they shouldn't have. They make them comfortable in their sin. They let you know, it's all right to be a rebel against God. It's all good. And I thought, God, please. Maybe that church itself is a worse sin than his perversion. Because they're sending him to hell. But he's always feeling good. No, to walk in the light... It means that you have the will to see everything about you that God reveals. And you're not going to run away. And you're not going to cover it up. You're not going to go find some fig leaves. You're just going to stand there and let God cleanse you and clothe you himself with his righteousness. And it's ongoing. It's like repentance. It's ongoing. Stay in the light. Why? I've been a Christian for 40 years. There's still so much crud about me that comes to the surface. Reading the Bible, praying with other Christians, worshiping God. It just comes up. It's like, when's it going to be done? I hate it. I love Jesus, but I hate what I made of myself. How I corrupted myself. I don't blame anybody. I don't blame my parents. I don't blame anyone on this earth. I did it. I'll tell you one thing. I'm not leaving the light. I'm going to stay right here. Why? Because what Isaiah found and what Peter found is the same light that reveals sin will purge it out of your life. How many want that? Not everybody wants that. Not everybody wants that. I want that. I'm tired of it, man. I hate sin. I hate evil. And if that's what walking in the light is, then what's walking in darkness? Notice he said, if you tell yourself you haven't sinned, then you're walking in the darkness. What does it mean to walk in darkness? Well, that means that you make some kind of effort not to see. Close the shades, the shutters, and don't See what the light of God really reveals. Tell yourself it's okay. Send up a fog of obscuration. Just to fade it all out. Mix in a little religion. Just enough to salve the conscience. Never enough to pierce the heart, man. Like the, like the prophet told Mary when she dedicated Jesus in the temple. This child is set for the rise and fall of everyone. Everyone's going to be revealed for what they are as a result of contact with this child. And he said, and even a sword will pierce your own soul. Go right to the middle. It's the willingness and insistence on cover-up, obscurity, the fog people cloud themselves with. Don't tell me anything. Don't tell me anything. Once saved, always saved. Don't tell me anything. I don't want to know a thing. I'm telling you, that is a bad sign. I know one person very close to me I used to witness to all the time. And she started saying to me, tell me there's no hell. I don't believe in God or anything. Tell me there's no hell. Tell me there's no hell. Tell me there's no hell. That is literally the meaning of walking in the darkness. Walking in darkness doesn't mean, oh, you do this evil thing and that evil thing and this evil thing and that other thing. Any more than walking in the light is, oh, you do this good thing or that good thing. No, that's not what either one of those are. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with whether or not you're willing to be seen as you are before God. It's not even about other people. That's part of the cloud. They make it all about other people. Oh, people are judging me. 
Well, I hate to pop your bubble, but you're not that important that everyone's looking at you. Seriously. They're already looking at themselves. Why? Because we're here in the house of light. I came to church to draw near to God. Show me what you will, O Lord, and every plant in me that my heavenly Father has not planted, pluck it out by the roots and let me get rid of these false loves that I keep on getting infected by and let me only want and love the true and the good and righteousness. This is eternal life, to know you, the only true God and Jesus whom you have sent. And then finally, and I'll close here, walking in the light is connected to confession of sin. What a lost art. What a lost art. The confession of sin. I used to think I knew what it meant because of my Catholic background. I could fall back on that. Well, you got to go and find a priest and tell him what you did and then wait breathlessly for his pronunciation Te absolvo, I forgive you. Then you have a brief moment of, this is good, but I won't make it through the week <laughs> with this feeling. What bondage, right? That's not what confession of sin is. You must confess your sins to God. And the word confess doesn't mean you say, I'm sorry, I feel so bad. That's called penance, by the way. That's another false concept. Penance is not repentance. Repentance means you think again about what you've done. You say it's all right. God says it's a sin, and you surrender. All right, God, I'll go with what you say. It's a sin. I was saying it was just a little white lie. God says, thou shalt not bear false witness. Well, who's right? Who's right? <laughs> You go to church, you get convicted. That was a lie. It wasn't, fa it wasn't a little white lie. That was false witness you bore. All right, I surrender. I confess to God. It's a word that means to say the same thing as God. Remember, walking in the light is the indispensable condition for any fellowship you're going to have with God, which means that whatever God reveals, you got to agree with. You don't have your own opinion. You don't have your right to how you see it. He looked at the tree and said, man, that looks good to me. And that's what got them thrown out of fellowship with God. She made up her own mind. We're coming back full circle. I don't care how it looks to me. God, what do you want? I've heard every justification for sin. It was fornication's right because in the Bible they were getting married at 14 and 15. God never expected a 25-year-old, 30-year-old man to be celibate all his life. Well, there you go, walking in darkness, obscuring everything. Okay. You'll never have fellowship with God until you say the same thing that he says about everything. Dear God, I surrender. You said that fornication is a sin. Forgive me. I committed fornication. You don't have to say you're sorry. You don't have to feel bad for a week and hope that that'll get you over it. Look what he says. If we say the same thing as he says about our sins, he says, he is faithful and just. It's a matter of his faithfulness to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Man, this is one of the simplest verses in the Bible, but I'll never tire of bringing it up for you. It's just so important. I mean, you know, I can't live spiritually without forgiveness of sins. I gotta have my sins forgiven. You got to go through it at night when you lay in bed. If you, you can't sleep, go through the day. Think about what you did or what you said. Every sin that you committed, take to God and just confess it. Dear Lord, I didn't treat that person right. Well, that wasn't honest what I said. Oh, dear Lord. Some, man, that seems tedious. Well, let's put it this way. 
I've blogged on my blog for five years, and I've written 800 articles. And I have spell check and grammar and all this stuff. You won't believe it, I know, but it's true. I do have these. And everything I do wrong, I, it, it gives green underlining and red underlining to tell me that I went wrong. Okay. You got to remember, I went to Prairie High School. But anyway, <laughs> first time I did it, like every line was bad. Every line. But I'd go back and try to correct it, or I have people editing helping me to correct it. The more I do it, the less red and green I see. Why? Well, I'm getting purified of bad writing habits. I've actually done it where there's nothing, nothing wrong. Okay. Look, think about your spiritual life. Well, why should I waste time just going through my day and confessing sin? Well, number one, this, this, is a, this is an exercise. This is the ordained of God right here, 1 John 1, 9. This is an exercise that will reinforce the hatred of sin. You'll never be free of any sins unless you cultivate a holy hatred of them. You, you, you just can't slide through life and be all right. We're, we're corrupt, remember? We're fallen. The best of us are still so fallen, we can't believe it. But through the regular practice, I can't believe I even have to say it. I'm just a fashion of sin. <laughs> Dear Lord, I want to be on your side, Lord. Not my own anymore. And what happens is it sanctifies us. This makes us holy. This is the function of light. The light that exposes everything will purge it out if we just walk in the light. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive of us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, and then one other thing he says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with each other. Guess what? This is the fellowship of light. There's about 100 people here, or maybe. I don't know how many. Okay, now look. There is a, uh, there is a fellowship so real and the world has no knowledge of it, it has no idea what it's all about it's the spirit right we are one there's people here we never met before this weekend but now we feel like we've known you all our lives don't we pastor I mean it's just real the fellowship of the spirit is real and there could be a hundred people here and there could be 97 of them in that there could be three you may as well be a million miles, miles away. And it might hurt you even. I remember seeing that at some of the God church thinking, these people got something. I don't have it. They got it. Oh, I wish I could be with them. Oh, I wish I could sing praises with them. Oh, I wish I could lift my hands and praise the Lord. But I couldn't. I just couldn't and knew it. You know why? I was in the dark. You walk in the light as he is in the light. Then we have fellowship with each other. Well, something changed when I got saved. It's like, now I'm in it. <laughs> it's real, not fake. I've gone to all over the world, as most of you know, and everywhere in the world I've met, we meet people from all walks of life, don't we, Ray? And it is like you knew them all your life. And people in the Philippines, poor as a, as a church mouse, will give us everything they have because of Jesus. But you'll always be on the outside if you want to stay in the darkness, if you refuse to confess your sins to God. If your life is one obfuscation after another, if it's a big play act, hypocrisy is short-sighted anyway because there's nothing hidden that won't be revealed and there's nothing secret that won't be shouted from the mountaintops, right? May as well get real. But for the real, it's a fellowship of the Spirit. And he says, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from each and every item. You know what he's talking about there? 
that in this Christian discipleship, there's a lot of things I do I don't, don't even know are sinning. I, I'm constantly finding out of things that I used to accept that are actually wrong. And so what about those sins? The blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us of each and every sin as we just stay in the light. As we stay in the light. They say sunshine is 98% disinfectant. And darkness, mold, infection, sickness, and disease. Father, we pray to you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We pray in his name. I pray you bring every one of us into the light. I pray we'd make the commitment to stay there. I have never seen a, a time and a situation that's worse for people to just check out a church to fade out or fade in and out and not really be in the fellowship and in light. Put it in our hearts. We don't nag. Only the Holy Spirit can show a person how badly we need each other, how badly we need church, how badly we need the light. But I do pray you'd make it real, and I pray you'd breathe your breath of life on these faltering, faltering words. And bless this congregation and all who shall hear. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.